welcome to the Hunt Backcountry podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose, to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit Exo Mountain Gear. Dot com. Right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. This is episode 114, and tonight we have something different. Most of the time we're talking about species and hunts that you do out west, but tonight we're talking about something that you can do in the vast majority of the lower 48 and beyond, and that is hunt turkeys. So whether you're a guy in the east, in the midwest, or out west, we're going to talk turkey hunting and turkey calling. And if you guys haven't hunted turkeys, you're really into it. And I hope that this episode inspires you to do it. Some people say that hunting turkey is basically like hunting a 20 pound feathered elk. And I agree. The pursuit is so fun. The dynamics of calling the cat and the mouse game, man, it's such a blast to get out after turkeys. And tonight you are going to learn how to do that. Our guest on this episode is Scott Ellis. He's a Grand National Calling Champion, host of the Hunt Quest show, pro staff for several companies, and Scott has a very cool turkey hunting app. This app is called the Turkey Tech app, and you can find it in your app store for your mobile device. It includes audio and video instructions, sounds of wild turkey from actual turkeys in the field, tips on when to use specific calls, and so much more. So be sure to check that out after you tune into this episode with Scott Ellis. Before we get into the show, also wanted to thank Porkchop130. You left us a review on iTunes, and we really appreciate that. So we want to send you some Exomon Gear swag. Just contact me by sending an email to podcast at xmongear.com, and we'll get you set up with that. Listeners, if you want to enter into these giveaways, we want to see your review in iTunes or Stitcher or wherever else you might be listening to this. And you can always contact us directly as well to podcasts at exomontgear.com with any questions, comments, or feedback that you have. All right, let's dive into this episode with turkey hunting expert, Scott Ellis. Scott, welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast. How are you doing tonight? I am doing fantastic, my friend. I am out here with my kid, like literally minutes before we started this podcast, practicing our turkey calls because the Florida South Zone Youth Hunt is Saturday morning, and I have a show called Hunt Quest. It's on Carbon TV and on YouTube, uh-huh. and uh, it very often consists of my son, Jacob Ellis, who is a 2016, I'm sorry, 17, uh, Grand National Pulse Champion, and in this weekend, we are going to have Jake call in his very first turkey by himself. Awesome. Now, Jake has killed approximately 14 turkeys, Um Four of those last year was a single season Grand Slam, which we finished out in Oregon with Miriams and Rios. Uh, Kentucky was Easterns and obviously the Osceola Turkey here in Florida. So we were tightening up our calling right before we dialed into this podcast. So we're super excited. Our season is about to kick off and we are ready to bust up some turkeys. (laughs) That's cool, man. So do you guys live in Florida or are you headed down for the hunt? No, no. We live in Florida. I've born and raised my whole life. Uh, Left at 18 years old, was in the Army for six years. So I got to see the world, South Korea, Alaska, Japan, Texas, several other states, and then uh, ended up getting out in 99 and moved back to Florida in 2000. So that's I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of the Sunshine State, if you will. So. Yeah, very cool. I don't say it to be cliche. I sincerely mean it, man. Thank you for your service. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Very yeah. proud to do it, brother. Yeah, awesome. So... Yeah, you, I mean, oh man, there's so much that I want to talk about with turkey hunting. It's a, sh- it's a topic that we have like touched on 0% in the 100 plus episodes that we've been doing this podcast. I myself had, have uh, hunted turkeys in my home state of Missouri, have had so much fun doing it. Um, man, there's just so much that, but I'm self-taught. So like I, you know, I've made so many mistakes and just kind of figured out as I go, there's so much I want to learn. There's so much I want to talk about. Start with, um, you mentioned the slam. I just want to give listeners context for, you know, maybe not into turkey hunting. They're not even fully aware of the opportunities and the subspecies. What is the slam? What are the different species of wild turkey that are available to hunt uh, here in North America? 
Absolutely. Well, we start in Florida and from about Jacksonville down to, we'll call it Gainesville from a north east to south west trek is a line of demarcation and everything below that is the Osceola Turkey. Everything north of that in the panhandle and the northern part of the central part, not central, the northern part of the state of Florida is the eastern turkey. But below that line I talked about from Jacksonville to Gainesville is the Osceola Turkey. That's needed for the Grand Slam. The Grand Slam consists, consists of four of the subspecies of the wild turkey, and that includes the eastern, which inhabits most of the United States from about, oh, I would say eastern Oklahoma, Missouri, all the way to the eastern seaboard and north. Okay, And then from there, you go into Texas, Oklahoma. Um, you have the Rio Grande turkey. That is the third leg of that uh, subspecies. And the fourth being the Miriam's turkey, which inhabits northwest Nebraska, Montana, Wyoming, uh, places in Oregon, Idaho. Um, there's a map that's on NWTF.org that depicts all the different subspecies subspecies throughout the United States. And um, those four, again, the Osceola, the Eastern, the Rio Grande, and the Miriam consist of the Grand Slam. Now, if you want to get really if you want to get really ambitious, then you go to Mexico and you hunt the Gould wild turkey. And that would complete the fifth bird would complete the Royal Slam. If you want to go further than that, you go to, to the Yucatan Peninsula and you go into the oscillated turkey, which is a cousin of the American wild turkey. And that is called the World Slam. So there's actually five wild turkey species, if you will. The fifth, the oscillated being the cousin of the other four that I mentioned in the Grand Slam. So, or, and the world slam, I'm sorry, the five in the world slam, the six being the oscillated, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So do you have all six? Cause I know you have multiple slams in terms of the four species here in the U S but have you ventured outside the U S and chased the others? Only the Goulds. Okay. And in that Mexico. is again in Mexico. And I have a, a double Royal slam and I probably will never hunt the oscillated Turkey down in, in um, South America and the Yucatan Peninsula because that turkey does not gobble. It's actually a cousin of the American wild turkey. It looks like a cross between a peacock and the American wild turkey. Beautiful bird, huh. very long spurs, no beard. They do not have the same language as the American wild turkey, and they do not gobble. So I just don't know if I have it in me to ever pursue that turkey because part of the excitement and the fun in hunting our wild turkeys here is the, is the gobble. That's what it's about. It's about the gobble. So. Yeah. yeah, and we're going to get to that for sure. <laughs> so those those four, let's take just the four, kind of leave Mexico out of the discussion for now. Okay. Um, but taking the four here in the U.S., because we have listeners, you know, in every territory that you just covered of these four species. So pretty much everybody listening to this in the U.S. can hunt one of these four. Are there exactly. different characteristics, uh, different behaviors, different calling styles that you take? I mean, how different are these subspecies? You know, I'm thinking like with elk. Uh, you got, you know, the Rocky Mountain and then you go mm -hmm. over the coast and you got rosies and Roosevelt. they're the same yeah. animal, but you know, there's some differences there. So kind of break that down for us with the turkeys. Are they much different? Absolutely. They, they're very different. Um, a turkey is a turkey is a turkey. I've always said that, but that being said, as you spoke about, there are different characteristics. The Osceola is pressured probably more than any of the other subspecies because it's concentrated in such a small area of uh we'll call it central florida you know what i'm saying from that line of demarcation south and that bird is very very concentrated in a small area um even the outfitters and the private land hunts can be very challenging again because of the pressure these birds are had on um outside of that the osceola turkey would probably be the least of uh, the uh call receptive of the subspecies they're their least call receptive they less is generally more with the osceola wild turkey um where you go out west to a miriam and i'll break this down as i get into this further you can call to them i, I say they have add because you can call <laughs> you have to call and you have to keep them entertained or they're they're nomadic they travel a lot so they're going to leave if you're not keeping their interest peak then they're going to very often walk away from you because they are not engaging them now, you go to Osceola down in Florida, and less is more. Uh, they're very wary, wary, wary birds. They're very cautious birds. They tend to gobble a lot less than the other subspecies. Now, there's always exceptions to the rule. 
there's always Osceola's that will gobble their brains out all the way to the gun barrel and you shoot them and it's like, wow, that was just like shooting a Miriam. But, but more times than not, after hunting them for over 30 years, the Osceola less is more. You have to call a lot less. If you overcall them, they will tend to hang up. They will tend to want to strut and display out in front of you and not come into gun range. Now, we move to the Easterns. In my opinion, the Easterns are the second hardest, meaning and, – and people will argue this point. I mean, this is just my opinion, so just the disclaimer there. <laughs> there's, there's people who are oh, the Eastern turkeys way hard, not so whatever. But in my opinion, after hunting them both for over 30 years, the Eastern would be the second toughest, and they, they are very often um, very susceptible to overcalling. If you talk too much to them, they're going to hang out there and display, and they, they're going to play hard to get. They're wanting the hen to go to them. Because remember, in turkey hunting in the spring, we are effectively reversing nature. Now, a gobbler gobbles and struts in the spring to attract the girlfriends, the women. And what we're doing is we're setting in a stationary position, and we're emulating a, a hen, the female, and we're trying to get him to come to us. When in nature, generally, the gobbler gobbles, the hens go to him. So that's the beauty of what we're doing. So the eastern turkey, again, going into the second hardest, in my humble opinion, um, well, again, less is more. Um, you can maybe call them a little bit more than the Osceola turkey, but as a whole, you have to be very sparing on your calling or you'll get them to hang up, what we call hanging up. Now, when we move into Rio's and move into Miriam's, it's another ball game. I would say Rio's are the third most difficult to call. Um, you can give them a lot more conversation. You can get them jazzed up a lot more with excited cutting and yelping. And we can probably get into that. I'll, I've got a mouth call sitting right here with me. So we can probably do some uh, demonstrations of the different calls that I do use to get them fired up and get them excited. But the Rio, you can call a little more too than you can an Eastern. Now, when you get into the Miriam turkey, the Miriam, as I mentioned earlier, has the ADD effect. And those birds... Well, very often, if you don't call to them and engage them constantly, they will wander off. They'll drift. And a perfect example of that, and again, I'm plugging my show here, but Hunt Quest, there was a show, one of my episodes, episode two, that's now on Carbon TV and YouTube. If you'll go in and watch episode two, Jake, my son, and I are in Oregon hunting Rios and Miriams, and you will hear me calling a bunch just constantly. I mean, calling more than I would ever call in Florida or anywhere in the east. And I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm keeping these birds interested. And I'm keeping them gobbling. Now, if you go to episode, I believe three, it's called Bluegrass Gobblers. I'm hunting in Kentucky and I'm hunting some hard headed Easterns. And you will clearly hear my calling scenarios and sequences are, are probably a quarter of what I did to those birds out West. All right. So pre hunt, before we get into calling and tactics and things like that, what can we do to locate turkeys to try and, make sure that we're in the right area are we looking for sign are we trying to visibly track them are we trying to do locators before our hunt kind of walk us through the maybe you know weeks or days or just the day before a hunt of making sure that we're uh, getting on birds right 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 awesome question i mean scouting is is can be one of the most effective parts of your of being successful during the springtime i for example i travel a ton I hunt in numerous states, um, and I don't get the opportunity to scout as much as I would love to be able to scout. So a lot of times I'm going on secondhand information and places I go where they've heard a bird, seen a bird. Um, so for anybody that's doing it that has the accessibility to, to go out to their property and listen, that's a big, huge deal. Vocalizations are awesome. Going out at daybreak, if you get a moment or two before work, um, that's huge. Just hearing where they're gobbling in the mornings and where they're roosting, especially if they're roosting continuously in the same areas, that gives you a starting point. The other thing is really huge is just looking for sign, for tracks, for droppings, for feathers, for strut marks in the road. Strut marks being when the bar birds display, their wings pop out, they squat down, and they bit into a big ball, if you've seen them in pictures, strutting. And you'll see strut marks in the roads and anywhere that will allow those swing tip feathers to drag and leave sign. You'll see those. Um, and the other thing would be visual visualizations, simply going out with binoculars and hitting open areas 
turkeys love open areas. They'll live fields, they'll live crop fields, they'll live pastures. Anywhere they can see for long distances, they love that because a gobbler can display and a hen can see them from a long distance, which will attract hens. So you got, like I said, you've got your sign, you've got vocalizations, and then you've got um, visualizations. And those are the three key ways that you would scout going out in the woods. Now, you mentioned locators. Another great way, um, you have crows or ravens out west. Ravens are a great way to get a bird to gobble. Uh, in the south, in southeast, we have crows. Uh, same bird, similar bird, a little bit different sounds. Um, you can use owl hooters. You can use the great horned owl out west. In the south and the southeast and the northeast, you use the barred owl. Um, these are great ways to start at daybreak and at dusk to identify roost locations so you can find these birds and kind of pinpoint where they're roosting and where you start your hunt in the morning. Awesome. I've always heard that term in terms of locating with, you know, crow call and owl call or something in terms of getting the birds to like shock gobble. Is that right. truly what it is? Or is there, I mean, do we know from science or from people who've studied this, hmm. what it is that makes those birds respond to an owl, for example? Um, I don't know the science. I don't think anybody can climb into the, the brain of a turkey. <laughs> yeah. We don't have quite that, have that technology yet, but from doing it for a long, long time, any rashes, loud noise will get a bird to gobble. That being said, what I did leave out is a hawk screamer. A coyote howler is huge out west. They will gobble their brains out at a coyote howling. They will gobble at a goose. They will gobble at an elk bugle. So any loud, rashes noise, I would, and you ask, is it a shot gobble? In my opinion, it is a shot gobble. It's literally a reaction to a loud noise. And you, an air horn, uh, a bolt of thunder, or a bolt of lightning with the report of thunder has been hugely successful. I've hunted turkeys many times on the back end of thunderstorms, and they will gobble their brains off at rumbling thunder in the distance. Um, so I hunt South Carolina a good bit here in the southeast and I have a great buddy that's a big goose hunter and I always have him bring his goose call to the woods and he starts honking and clucking on his goose call and that will very often jerk a gobble out of one. So um, why they do it, I can't explain it other than just a loud noise triggers a gobble, um, but it is very, very effective in locating and scouting. Hmm. That's so wild, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of convenient. Really, it's kind of convenient. <laughs> yeah, I've had buddies who are like, "Yeah, you know, it, when I when I go out, you know, get out there before daybreak, and you're so often like, if you're hunting deer or whatever, these guys here in Missouri, and they're so used to being quiet." One of my buddies like, "Yeah, my strategy is, you know, I get there, I get dressed, and I just slam my truck door as loud as I can to try and get something to shock gobble." <laughs> <laughs> and you know. Um, we don't know a turkey's ability to reason or rationalize, but any human noise is, is something that I will still steer clear of an air right. horn. Now, that being said, I've had, I've had, uh, uh, ambulances and fire trucks and police cars running a call out on a highway and the sirens wailing and I'd have them gobble the brains out. But as a rule, general rule of thumb, if I can, if I can control the sounds that are being used to get a shot gobble, it's going to be something that's very far from human, something yeah. that they would not alert them to danger or alert them to the presence of a human. Now, again, do we know if a turkey can actually do that? We don't. But uh, there's plenty of other ways of locating outside of a truck door or an air horn that I mentioned <laughs> yeah. earlier <laughs> that, that, that are a very effective way to get them to gobble. So um, Go with know, something natural. <laughs> Yeah, just stuff, something that's natural. It's, it's, that's just common sense. Use something natural. So if if guys are patterning a bird, whether, you know, maybe they're hearing them from a similar location, maybe they're at a spot where they can kind of glass them up and, you know, they maybe see a trend. At this, you know, at the time of year when most seasons are open for these species, are they they're, are they in a pattern? Are they pretty patternable? Is, are they fairly reliable with their routine? Um, to some degree, and again, this goes back into a, a, a huge dissertation on different subspecies. Uh, the Miriams and the Rios traditionally have roost areas that they will use day in day out. They will they will they will roost in these areas. They will fly down. There's some type of loop or pattern that they use, 
and they will very often end up right in the same group of trees. And a lot of times, Mark, this is contingent on the fact that there's not many places to roost. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into the prairie type conditions in the into Oklahoma and Texas, um, the more open areas, there's cottonwoods, there's big tree pockets, and that's the only place they can roost. Now, when you move out to the Pacific Northwest, where I love to hunt, a lot of big woods there, but they are still somewhat, they're more patternable than what I would say in the eastern the Osceola. An eastern and an Osceola turkey, there's so many woods where we hunt here for the most part. Um, outside of pasture land and the crop fields um, that will that will sometimes concentrate them. There's a lot more big woods that these birds can roost in, and they will quite honestly, more often than not, you're going to find them roosting maybe in a general area, but very often not like you, you couldn't go out there the next morning and go, we're going to start 80 yards from that tree because that's where he's roosting at. Sometimes... Sometimes they do get repetitive in the roost areas in the east, in the northeast, in the southeast, okay? I'm kind of keeping this geographical here. But very more often than not, Osceola's and Easterns will roost wherever they happen to end up that afternoon. You go to you go out west more to Miriams and Rios, and they will generally tend to roost in those same traditional areas more so than our birds in the east, in the northeast, and the southeast. So Okay, perfect. So this is a totally selfish question. Uh, <laughs> here in Missouri, you know, most of the places I hunt heavily timbered, I don't hunt up North I'm more in the Southern end of things. Um, should I be putting any stock into, uh, turkey activity that I observe while I'm deer hunting in the fall? Should I put any stock into that in terms of locations, activities, behaviors, patterns when spring rolls around and that spring season opens up? Should I go back to those same areas where I'm seeing them in the fall while I'm deer hunting? You've done your homework, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> These are some great questions. Um, you know, I would say first initial reaction is no, because turkeys during the fall are following completely different patterns. They're following food sources, clearly and, and ultimately following food sources. And where they are during the fall, they're going to be in big flocks, brood flocks, I call them, which consist of the mama hen with Jake's and Jenny's. Sometimes you'll get um, what I call uh, uh, not the, you have bachelor flocks. That's going to be your long beards. Your mature gobblers will flock together. Sometimes you'll get those rampant Jake flocks where a bunch of a band of brothers, if you will, will get together and they'll run together all fall. But more times than not, you're going to get the brood flocks, which consists of the mother hen and her offspring. Now, when those food sources deplete, they move on to the next food source and they're constantly looking for food. So when, what you see in deer season when you're capitalizing on cash crops, soybeans, corn, whatever that may be, and they're feeding on those sources, well, by the springtime, those are gone. So they're, the flocks are going to change. The patterns are going to change. And ultimately, when the spring rolls around, those bachelor flocks of long beards are going to break up. Um, quite often, the jakes will split off from the brood flocks. And you'll have flocks of jennies and hens. You'll have jakes, flocks of jakes. And then the gobblers will break off. The mature birds will break off into singles because they're out looking for the hens. Uh, and the hens will split off to some degree. But ultimately, to answer your question, I would not put any stock whatsoever. I mean, you can start in those same places. There may be something that will hold those birds on in the springtime. It could be... Um, let me help me with my terminology. Is it perennials or annuals that will actually regenerate during the spring each year after they die? They'll regenerate. They'll, is that perennials or annuals? I, I do not have a green thumb. What's wrong with perennials? <laughs> I think it's perennials. So those type of deals, clover, that type of, of crop that re regrows during the spring may end up pulling birds back to those same areas. But as a general rule of thumb, I would not put any stock in what you see in the fall. Those birds are going to break up. They're going to be on different patterns. You have to truly, to be effective, you need to start the scouting process all over again. And that would basically be, um, it's hard because in Florida, I mean, it's 88 degrees here in Florida and in, in end of February. Yeah, and it's warm here, hot here, it's summer mm -hmm. here. So it's a little different for Florida because we don't have the winters you guys have. But as it starts to warm, I would say in, in early to mid to late March in the, the states that actually have four seasons, that's when I would start going out, listening to birds on the roost, looking for sign, looking for strut marks, listening in the mornings, using that same stuff we talked about earlier. Yep. Okay, perfect, perfect. 
So before we dive into calling, because there's so much to talk about there, I'm <laughs> curious, because uh, I know you're a caller. I mean, you're you know a competition caller. You just actually love the interaction of calling while you're hunting. What role do decoys play for you personally? And then how do you feel about them, um, you know, kind of for your average hunter, for me? Well, that's a great question, Mark. Um, I learned to turkey hunt on public ground in the late 80s in Central Florida, hunting Osceola turkeys. And decoy explosion occurred probably, I mean, people have been using deeks for years. But it really got big in the mid, early to mid 90s with the, um, invention the feather flex decoy which was a foam injection molded decoy not very realistic but it was a decoy that being said i do not use decoys what i found is i as when they hit the market back 20 years 25 years ago i used decoys i bought one of them just like everybody else probably did for 24.99 and i employed it on my setups and what i found more times than not for me was gobblers would stand there at 75 yards and look at your decoy and inevitably walk off. Um, that could have been due to various factors. It could have been hunting pressure. It could have been the fact that realism isn't there like the new decoys are of today's um, uh, decoys that you're seeing. But I learned that setup and calling and woodsmanship was way more important than just visualizing on a decoy. Now, now that we've come a long way in 25 years and the realism is there, um, it's not a bad, it's not a bad uh, um, tool to use for the average turkey hunter to get out there and kill a turkey. There's nothing wrong with decoys. They, people kill them by the thousands and thousands every year. Um, they can be effective. Um, a lot of it has to do with where you position them and how you position them and how that's particular setup is involved whether it's uh open fields they can be effective whether it's um uh using a jake decoy or a gobbler decoy when you're challenging a old gobbler for dominance when you set a jake decoy with a hen decoy the gobbler sees the jake the gobbler says well no 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 you're not going to come in on this sexy hen i've been hearing yelping and cutting to me so they can be effective um and I would not discourage anybody from using a decoy. It's just not my cup of tea. It's not what I have learned to use. I have learned to use setup and terrain and and better than average calling to be successful in the spring woods. And when I say setup, I mean putting yourself in a position where when a gobbler has come close enough to make a visualization on the sexy hen that he is hearing – He's in gun range, and it's game over, dead turkey. So um, I use bends in the road. I use, if I'm on a field, I will set up 30 yards inside the field so that that bird hears the hen. The gobbler hears the hen yelping and cutting and all this sexy talk, but he knows because the turkey's eyesight is, is so amazing that he cannot see the hen that he's hearing. So what does he have to do to make contact with that hen? He has to come closer to her. And when he comes closer to her and he's in gun range, he's dead. So, again, bends in the road. Uh, anytime I'm hunting big woods, decoys are not nearly successful in hardwoods or, or big any kind of woods where the visibility is limited to 75, 80 yards. Um, if your setup is correct and you don't overcall, you play cat and mouse, and that gobbler has to come close enough, which would be gun range, to see the hen that he's hearing. When that happens and occurs, he's in gun range and he's dead. Um, again, there are certain situations where they work great, and they're great for TV. And if you like to watch one strut around and hump a decoy and, and attack a decoy and fight a decoy, that's great. That's not the art and the, and the romance for me. The romance for me is communicating to a turkey and, and talking to him in his own language or their own language and pulling him close enough to make a – uh, to get him in a gun range. That's the romance for me. It's not, it's not a visualization. It starts with a vocalization and a communication. So would not discourage anybody from using them. They can be very effective, um, but they can also be detrimental. And the fact that you'll be in a position where you set a deke and they're going to come in and look at him and they're going to hang up out there 75 yards at a gun range and they're going to walk off. Other times they're going to come charging in and you're going to kill turkeys. For me, there's, 
99.8% of the time when I set up and kill turkeys, that decoy would not have made any difference whatsoever in my setup and me killing that turkey. And that's how, in my opinion, you're being successful because they didn't need to see a stiff body decoy on a stake at 80 or 90 or 120 yards because you were in a position where they had to come into the lure of the beautiful calling, the lure of the cutting, the lure of the fact you're piquing his interest and his mood based on the communication you're having with the gobbler. Mm. Yeah, man, that's so good. Does that make any sense whatsoever? No, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it helps for sure. It helps for sure. I, I love what you said about the setup. Um, and that's something, again, kind of being self-taught and fumbling and learning by mistakes. That's something that I've realized is so, so key is that setup piece. Um, I think somewhat related to that, I'm curious if it is effective um to you, especially if you're using a mouth call, which again, we'll get to mouth versus handheld here in a minute, but throwing your call, changing direction, uh, playing with volume, is any of that effective in terms of kind of not giving that gobbler that you're after a pinpoint location, like maybe turning and throwing that vocalization? Is that helpful or does we're not fooling anybody with that? No, no, no. It's 100% effective. Um, because their hearing is in, is insane. I mean, it's, it's bionic, if you will. Um, so what we try to do when I, as I use calling and vocalizations more than I do visualizations, um, if you turn your, if, if I have a gobbler that's, uh, 80, 90, 100 yards, I will turn my head and cut my hand to my mouth and face away from him and then call several sequences. And regardless of how good their hearing really is, you, you, they think that that hen is further away or moving away from where they last heard her. It's like, it's, 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 if we were sitting here talking and I was using my hand, I can't, I can't, uh, depict it on this on Skype, <laughs> but you will clearly hear the pitch change, the volume change, the directional sound, the three directional, 3d directional sound change. And that is 100% effective. It is so effective and I have to coin my good friend, Denny Golvis out of Pennsylvania, who is a pioneer. He's a legend. He's a, a student of the wild turkey. Denny talks about this. What he called it back in the 80s was ventriloquism calling. And it's simply using your hands to call right to left. I I steer gobblers into gun range. When you have a bird drifting to the left, you cup your hand and you call out of the side of your mouth to the right. And you call to the right and it throws the sound. And as good as their hearing is, they are not able to deduce to the fact that, that you're doing this. They All they know is that it sounds further away as great as their hearing is. So you can literally steer the gobbler by using your hand in your head and your side of your mouth calling out of one side of the mouth or, your, or, the, or the other. You can literally steer a gobbler. I do this every season. This is proven 100% for over 32 seasons of calling these crack crazy birds that you can steer them by throwing the sound right or left. It is not a farce. It is not, it is, it's pure science. It's just the sound waves. And it's this fact that the, even though their hearing is good, you can throw that sound. It's like the uh, Doppler effect when a siren is coming at you versus then leaving you. You can't hear it. It's on you. It's loud. Then it goes away and it, and it starts getting decreasing in volume. It's the same, same terminology. It's the same science behind it. And, um, it is 100% effective by throwing that sound. It will make a difference in the direction the bird comes. And if you can actually steer that turkey, I know this sounds like this is a complete farce, <laughs> but it is 100% effective. And it's not like I'm selling a product. It's not like I, I you use your hand, your head, your mouth. And you steer turkeys by the direction of the sound you're emitting. It's that simple. That's so cool, man. I'm uh, I'm excited <laughs> to try that. I mean, it will work. It will work. I've kind of done it subconsciously, but even that whole idea of like trying to steer them in if they're veering off, man, that's that's cool. I, I'd love to experience that. And it works. The, the the one one disclaimer that I'll throw in there is just be very careful doing it because as he approaches and starts closing in. At that point, you obviously don't want hand movement and head movement. So you have to be very careful just because of the visual that you, you can bump a bird or spook a bird. Yeah. But when he's out there and you know you, you, he cannot make eye contact with you, 
that's when you use it and use it very effectively. Yep. Most people that are familiar with turkey hunting in any aspect are familiar um, with the insane vision of turkeys. At what range and what level of movement, I mean, do you allow yourself to get away with? Is there any sort of rules on that or you're just absolutely as motionless as possible? Well, the motionless as possible is always a good tactic, but the longer you do it, the more you understand what you can get away with. Now, once that turkey is in eyesight of your position, forget it. Meaning you can see them? Yes, basically. Well, I say that if you can see him with your eyesight, but, but I mean, it it depends on the openness of the train. It depends on, um, how much cover you have in front of you, whether you have a blind, whether you have a a pop-up blind, obviously you can get away with more movement. Um, I don't advocate pop-up blinds. I'm not a fan of them. Whether you have vegetation, a natural blind built, um, that's another factor. But ultimately when, if you can see him, you better quit moving. And now if he goes behind a tree, then you know, you can shift your head. You can throw your hand up real quick. It's all about eye contact and knowing his obstruction of his visibility. So if he goes behind a brush pile, obviously, you know, you can reposition your gun. You can throw your hand up real quick. You can make a quick call and throw it to the right, to the left, straight in front of you. But ultimately you have to be very, very careful of all any kind of movement. And you learn this. I mean, you learn this with time. The many, the more birds you call in, the more birds that you, you get a feel for when you can move. Like quite honestly, I mentioned my show hunt quest. Um, people have commented, my gosh, you are wiggling a lot. I go, I understand that I'm wiggling and I'm moving and I'm repositioning, but I don't, this is only occurs when I know that Turkey is behind cover and his view is obstructed and I can get away with it. It's not like I'm randomly just throwing my hand up trying to th- use ventriloquism calling and move it right to left and left to right. This is all contingent on what his view to me is. Now, don't get me wrong. Every now and again, you think they can't see you and there's a hole in a bush or a hole in that brush pile or whatever tree he was behind, his his head slightly behind that tree or around the edge of that tree, and he does see you move. But as a whole, you will learn that the longer you hunt them, that when you can and can't get away with movement. A couple advantages just right off the bat. With a with a mouth call with the diaphragm, there's obviously less movement involved unless you want to you know turn and throw it. There's no movement. Right. And then right. it also gives you the ability to throw it. Do you rely pretty much solely on mouth calls? Do you advise that for your average hunter? Or are there places for, you know, a pot call and the other handheld calls for your average guy out there? Or should they just learn to mouth call? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, the mouth call is the obvious answer because one simple factor, hands-free operation. And again, let's disclaimer, if you're throwing the sound and moving your hand right, left, all that as a whole, when you're set up, right? Like that's not optional. If you're using a handheld call, you got to move it. You got to work it. When you're set up and you don't want to move and you want to emit turkey vocalizations, you can do that with absolutely zero movement, maybe a little jaw movement. Um, With a pot call, a box call, um, even a tube call, which I love running a tube call for running and gunning. That's a whole nother podcast, <laughs> but, but you know, when you're set up and you've got to pick up the call in the left hand and stroke the paddle with the right hand, or you, now there are little gimmicks out there available where you can strap a pot call that straps to your leg and you can hold the striker in one hand and you can run the striker with minimal movement on the pot call that's strapped to your leg. There, there are devices out there that can help cut down the movement. But when it all comes down to it, you cannot go wrong using a mouth call, um, especially if you truly master it and you can create all the vocalizations on it. Now, that being said, one of the biggest factors that we talked about earlier, especially with the Eastern Osceolas, is overcalling. And the beauty of friction callers, and there are guys that you cannot run a mouth call, but the beauty of that is when they run a box call or a pot call, they get the bird going, they get him gobbling, they get him coming. And then they get nervous because they're worried about the movement. So what do they do? They put that call down and they quit calling. And one of the most effective methods of killing it, the wild turkey, especially Easterns and Osceolas, disclaimer, is playing cat and mouse. 
And when that gobbler has heard this hen, really excited, really hot, she's telling him she's welcome. She's, she wants to have his company. And then she goes quiet. Well, that is one of the most devastating tactics you can have. Again, on Easterns and Osceolas, more so than Miriam's and Rios. Okay, I, I'm going to throw that out there throughout the podcast because I don't want people to get confused in the two. And so that being said, I think a lot of turkeys are killed with friction devices because the guy gets too concerned with his movement being being um, uh, uh, depicted. And he puts his call down, gets his gun up, and he waits him out. And playing cat and mouse with an Eastern Osceola it can be super effective. Again, with a Rio and a Miriam, that cannot be as effective because a lot of times you have to call a lot more to those two subspecies. So that's a little nice little twist on friction versus air. And obviously when you're running air on a Miriam and a Rio, you can continue to call, continue to call with no movement. And if you're cunning Osceolas and Easterns, the same thing can occur, but you can also shut down the movement and shut down the calling. And, and then you can call as needed without any movement. If that turkey decides that he needs more love, if you have to talk to him a little bit sweeter, you don't have to pick your call back up with a mouth call. It's already in your mouth. You can cluck, cluck and purr. You can cut at him a little bit. You can yelp to him. You can whine to him. You can keep your own, whatever. Whatever you want to say to him, you can continue to do without having to worry about picking up a call. So let's let's begin to talk about the actual vocalizations. Um, so I'd love to hear, um, not only hear the call, if you can kind of do a quick example, and I know that the quality is not going to be perfect over Skype, but as much as that, I want to understand uh, what that call, that particular vocalization communicates to the bird and then like in what situation do you want to use that um you know relating this to something we've talked a lot about on this show being elk calling obviously mm -hmm. again you have you have a cow call you have a, a bull bugle but then even within each one of those you kind of have a challenge versus a seduction and you're saying these different things with vocalizations you're not just randomly making animal noises no, I um, so begin to walk us through that, um, you know, from the female end of the things. We're trying to seduce this gobbler to us. Like, what are some of the noises? Um, what do they mean? What are we communicating? Or what should we be communicating? Absolutely. I mean, and I'm going to do this on a mouth call. And again, as you said, disclaimer, um, the, the, we'll see how the sound comes across. But you'll get the gist of probably what you need to do as I'm describing these sounds. And the cool thing about it, I have never elk hunted. Um, I have a new app out. It's called Turkey Tech with Scott Ellis. It's available in the App Store and on Google Play. And it has friction instruction with audio. It has a video video instruction with audio. It has mouth call video instruction with audio as well. It has printed text tips and explanations of the call. And more importantly, it has the wild turkey creating those sounds. So you can... And to boot, it has an ability to record yourself and play them against myself, a three-time Grand National Calling Champion, as well as the wild turkey itself, which is way more important to me, way more important to me. So remember this, and, and I'm learning, and I, I understand the, the anatomy, if you will, of elk calling and talking to an elk, and you're capitalizing on challenging him with dominance by another bull elk or another elk, and you're also capitalizing on breeding urge which would be the cow elves. Same thing in turkey hunting. You're capitalizing on if you're going to challenge him and challenge his dominance, you're going to gobble at him. You're going to try fighting purr or even a Jake or gobbler yelp. And then if you're hen calling, you're going to cut and you're going to yelp and you're going to cluck and cluck and purr and you're going to whine. You're going to tree call. You're going to cackle. So that being said, um, Let's start off from the roost. I mean, this can get really long-winded. I'm going to try to go through this as quick as I can, Mark. But when you set up on a gobbler, the gobbler's gobbling on the roost, you're going to try to get in within, say, 100 yards of this turkey. And the first thing you want to do is make initial contact with him. And initial contact consists of emulating a turkey on the roost. And when they wake up in the morning, they do a very soft, muted yelp. And it's called a tree call. And this is what they do when they're on the roost. And then from here, all you're doing is saying, oh, my goodness, there's another hen over here, and she's going to make contact with him. And I'll demonstrate that real quick on a mouth call. We're going to do some bubble clucks, 
A bubble cluck is a short, abrupt note, very soft, like a water drop hitting a tin pan. You're going to hear that and understand what I'm saying when I do it. And then you're going to tree call. And then again, this is emulating a hen turkey waking up on the roost. So we're going to do bubble clucks and tree calls. Here we go on the mouth call. And as you heard, very muted, soft little water drop type clucks. And all this is a hen waking up on the roost. From there, I'm going to wait till the sun starts breaking. I'm going to listen to his frequency of gobbling. Is he gobbling on his own? Is he gobbling out ravens, crows, coyotes, whatever other shot gobble sounds are out there? How fired up is he? And from there, when it gets a little bit more daylight, I'm going to give what's called a fly down cackle. And all the fly down cackle is, is a sharp cutting, chopping note that signifies that that hen turkey has flown from the roost and hit the ground. Okay, she's flown out of the tree. And, and that's usually joined with some of those same bubble clucks and those soft, pretty yelps. And then he, she flies down. And this is a fly down cackle. And all I did right there was signify that I flew down. And now the game is on. The hen is on the ground. She's on the ground. So at this point, though, I mean, at this point, we're not, you know, we're not trying to get the gobbler to move. We're not, you know, calling him over. We're just simply kind of making our presence known, right? Right. We are, we are uh, uh, depicting a hen on the roost that got excited and she flew to the ground and she's on the ground waiting on it. Now, from there, that's when I go silent. From there, all I'm doing now is letting him gobble his brains out, do whatever it is he's going to do, but the game begins when he flies down and his feet hit the ground. That's when we start calling to him. That's when we start figuring out where he's going. That's when the game begins. But if you don't have visual on him on the roost, you know, we've heard him in the not, morning. Not right. Yeah. We, will he do like a fly down um, call no. as well so that you know he hit the ground? How uh, would you know that he hit the ground? Be. I mean, I've heard, a, again, I've always got to throw it out there. I mean, turkeys will do what they're not expected to do and make a fool of you nine out of ten times. But, no, the gobbler during the spring does not do a fly-down cackle. I've heard them during the fall do fly-down cackles, but he, you're going to hear heavy wing beats. <laughs> You'll, you, if you're close enough to him. Now, if you've not gotten tight enough to his roost position, you may not hear that. And the only way you're going to know that is you'll clearly hear his gobble become more muffled and you'll hear it right or left of where his original roost position was. So once that happens and he gets on the ground, I like to greet him with some clucking and some light yelping. And that's two of the most common calls that will kill turkeys in the spring. A cluck is a short, abrupt note that's used for flock spacing. If you're in a big wad of turkeys, if you're in a big flock of turkeys, they will cluck as they're easing through the woods, they'll cluck and purr. Or that's used for a curiosity call to hear, they'll hear another hen, they'll hear another gobbler, they'll cluck to them to try to elicit a response, okay? So I'll throw some clucks in, and then the yelp is the, the universal call for breeding, for fall flocking, for any time of the year, the hen yelp is the call, the go-to call. Yelping kills more turkeys than any call that's produced by humans year in, year out, and, it, and I will argue that till I'm dead. But, you know, because that's the one sound that hunters are being emulating for since the Indians were doing on wing bone calls 200 years ago. So that being said, the gobbler flies down. I give him a minute. I'm going to cluck a couple times and engage him and say, hello, how are you doing? And give him just a, some clucking and yelping. And we'll give that on the mouth call. there does he gobble does he respond he may start moving to you right off the bat and say holy moly that's a sexy hen i gotta go find her you know you, you're not going to know what he's going to do that's the beauty and the fun of turkey hunting he may run you over after that one sequence 
He may answer you immediately, but not make any movement whatsoever. He may just sit there and gobble. And then we go into stage three or where, where we're talking about right now. And at that point, the key to calling a bird effectively is to keep his interest peak and to keep him moving to you in a forward progression. Keep him moving to you. Keep him moving to you. Now, whether that goes means going silent and just shutting up, you can just go quiet after that sequence. You've, you've engaged him. He answered you. Give him a few minutes. See if he starts wandering your way. Does he gobble on his own? Does he go quiet? If he goes quiet, then I'm going to get a little more excited, and I'm going to cut at him a little bit. And cutting is similar to the fly down cackle, but in a different, more broken, broken rhythm. It's not the crescendo effect. Cutting is those same type sharp notes, but it's going to be in a, I say, I call it a one, 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 two rhythm. It's a popping one, two being a double note and a single note being a one pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. And that, sh that call exudes excitement. It shows the gobbler that she's interested. It shows the gobbler that she is excitable. So from there, again, if he goes quiet and nothing's happening, then I'm going to step up my calling a little bit. And again, every scenario, Mark, could be slightly different. We're trying to guideline what a guy would do from the roost to the ground and working in a turkey. So, um, you know, a lot of variables are here, you know, from obstacles and terrain to other hens that are with him that you hear start yelping when he hits the ground and hens fly down with him. There's a million variables. This is just a basic 101 on how I would engage a gobbler from the roost to the ground. So that's, I'm just trying to, there's always variables uh, that the turkey hunter to be successful always has to be three dimensional. He has to understand that. So we're just given a basic rundown of how we're going to do it. So going back to that, the gobbler is not real interested. He, he, he gobbled to you those first couple scenarios, those couple sequences. And at this point, he's not making any forward progression. So what am I going to do? I'm going to probably yelp at him a couple more times like I just did. And then I'm going to try him again and give him a few minutes. If that fails, at that point, you know that just the basic calling is not going to pique his interest. It's not going to get him supercharged. It's not going to get him in the mood for love. That's when I start doing the cutting that I mentioned earlier. And what I'll do this is what is called an excited yelp, which consists of some of those cut notes mixed with him yelping, some yelping. And here we go. Here, I'll demonstrate that on mouth call. Now you can hear the excitement in that. Mm -hmm. Those fast notes, the yelp sequence was picked up in rhythm. And hopefully that gets his attention and goes, well, this lady, she means business. <laughs> She's ready to breed. You know, I got to go find this girl. And from there, hopefully that gobbler does a 180 and starts closing the distance. If he doesn't, well, then I might get even more excited and even more excited. If none of that works, then it goes into a whole other level of tactics. It goes into being quiet and clucking and purring. I may go quiet after engaging him for a few minutes with that excited stuff. I'll do a cluck and purr, and I'll demonstrate that on a mouthful. Cluck and purr is basically what I just told him was, I'm hot to trot. I'm ready for love. I'm ready for action, but you're not ready for action. So I'm going to go back to feeding and being content, and then my mood's going to change, and I'm not going to have nothing to do with you. So we're going to cluck and purr, and I'll, and I'll demonstrate that. Here we go, clucking and purr. And as you can see, no level of excitement, very content, very quiet. I'm not interested in you anymore, mister. I'm going to ease off and feed and eat acorns or whatever and ease off in the sunset. So that basically, you, you've turned his mood from trying to get him supercharged to bringing him back down a level and saying, I'm not interested in you anymore. It's like a guy going to a bar. I hope this is appropriate. <laughs> and, a girl's, <laughs> and a girl's talking sweet nothings into his ear. And then about an hour into this conversation, she goes, ah, you know what? I'm not interested in you anymore. And she walks off and goes start playing pool in the corner of the bar and pays no, the guy no attention. That's, that's effectively what I just did. And what happens to most men after they've been talked to and they've been excited, what happens to them whenever they play hard to get? Right. right. Well, what happens? The gobbler, the, the man does what? Yeah. Pursues her even harder? Yeah. Exactly. 
And that's, again, capitalizing on emotion and capitalizing on his feeling and trying to communicate with him with vocalizations. You're speaking to this turkey. You're talking to him in his own language. So now from there, if that doesn't work, if you play cat and mouse and you get coy and shy, from there I may go completely silent. And then I shut up for 10 minutes. And that is another super effective method because not only did you go did you go to clucking and purring and being contented and not caring and showing any interest in him, you the gobbler may have think you left. So you shut up, you quit calling, and all of a sudden this gobbler that was very interested in you doesn't hear any more hen sound. So he's sitting there going, Oh my gosh, she's gone. Holy moly, let me wander over here and see where that hen was that I was just showing off to gobbling and 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 impressing the heck out of her. Now she's gone. So that's where if you can go silent for 10, 15, 20 minutes, that can be super effective. From there, we do what we talked about earlier, which is similar to bugling at a bull elk. That's the dominant elk. That's when you decide to gobble at him or you try to decide to do gobbler yelps or you stage a fight and, and you emulate two gobblers fighting probably over her um, fighting over her uh, respect, if you will, trying to gain her her allegiance, if you will, you know, you, you're emulating two gobblers that are start fighting, purring and gobbling, and you're trying to gain to to uh, uh, court her. And this guy that was left over here, 200 yards away or 100 yards away, now has what he thinks is two gobblers fighting over her love, if you will. And he's over here left out, so he may come charging in because he hears two gobblers fighting over trying to gain this girl's court, this woman and or this hen and gain her love. So now you're capitalizing on the male side of it, the dominant side of it. So, and then that in a nutshell is how you would work a bird from the limb to the ground. And again, Mark, we could talk for a, another three hours on <laughs> different right. scenarios, but that's a good rule of thumb. Start, start coy and soft, get excited. If you need to shut it back down. If you need to, if that doesn't work, go to the male side go to the dominant side, challenge his dominance, challenge his manhood. And that will kill a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, a lot of turkeys. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's such a helpful overview. Like just having that sequence, giving us some options to progress through it. That's incredibly helpful. What's your uh, go-to approach for gobble? Not in terms of when, and obviously we talked about what it did, but in terms of how you gobble, using a certain call, doing it in natural voice. Like how do you gobble? I gobble like a nat. With I use natural voice. I can use a diaphragm. Uh, a tube call is super effective. Um, if you're a duck hunter or a waterfowler and you want to try to do it on a gobble call, or I mean on a mouth call or a tube call, you're doing nothing more than a feed chuckle. Tuka 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 tuka. So you put a mouth call in, and all I'm doing is going tuka 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 tuka. Now, if you have a tube call, which I don't have laying here with me, and I apologize for that, you're going to do the same type of, of mechanics. Tuka, 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 tuka. Um, if you use a natural voice, what I do, and I, that, I'll explain this as best I can, and people are going to laugh at this, but when we were kids, I'm 43 years old. When I was a kid and we played machine guns in war, we would go, uh, 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 <laughs> and you're using your diaphragm in your throat, and you're just stopping and chattering the air. <laughs> so you bring that same, uh, uh, to a like a falsetto style, like a, and then you put it into a gobble type type rhythm, and you go, and then you have I gobble more like a Miriam or a Rio, but it is effective on Eastern and Osceola's as well. But and that's how I'm doing it with my natural voice. That's so there's awesome. three quick methods, and there are gobble calls out there. Um, there's the old gobble shaker, you just shake it, and that right. works very effectively. Yep, yep. Yeah. So cool. That man, that's helpful. Um, I don't, unless I totally spaced, I didn't hear you mention this one and I know it's a bit, it's not like one of the standard go-to calls, but again, my limited experience, El Connie night, there's whatever this mystique about sort of this special call, like the, almost the secret handbook call, uh, the Kiki or the Kiki run, like, what is that? When do you use it? Is there anything special about it? Um, the Kiki run is, there's nothing real special about it. It's a high pitch whistle the, that birds generally will do in the fall, but you do hear a lot of jennies and younger hens doing it during the spring. It's not uncommon to hear it. 
Um, the high pitch whistle will almost elicit a gobble as well as an air horn or an elk bugle or a hawk or a crow or an owl. Um, from a vocalization standpoint, um, I don't know what it triggers to. I've had, I've turned gobblers around that reacted to nothing that we just discussed, but I'd whistle at them and those same turkeys would turn and come to me. Um, I think sometimes those turkeys may have been a two-year-old gobbler, which is a mature gobbler, but a young mature gobbler. I think they're not, not that far removed from those fall flocks and those, those memories of being in flocks with younger sisters or siblings, if you will. That's my only theory to that. The most effective part of a kiki run is when a gobbler is hung up with hens and you use a kiki run to talk to the brood hen. The brood hen thinks she has a jenny that is lost and the maternal instinct kicks in. She'll come looking for this, what she thinks is a lost Jenny that's king and very often bring goblin and toe. So the, it's not magical. It's not the end all, the cure all call, but it's something that you use. Listen, to be a successful turkey hunter, brother, you need a million tricks in your, in your velvet crown royal sack. <laughs> <laughs> you need a big, deep bag of tricks, whether it's gobbler yelping, gobbling, fighting, purring, Clucking and purring, whining, kiki running, Jake yelping, wh whether it's repositioning, whether it's leaving him alone and coming back the next day, whether it's setting up where he wants to go. There's a million things you can try, and the successful turkey hunter is three-dimensional. That's the guy that has a million different tactics and, tactics and techniques to employ on that turkey, and he does something until it works. And if, it, and if it doesn't, none of it works, then he leaves that gobbler alone and comes back and fights him another day. But the guy that's one-dimensional that knows one way, cluck, yelp, cluck, yelp, cluck, yelp, cluck, yelp. That's the guy that's going to kill a turkey once a year, every other year, as opposed to the guy that's going to travel across the country like myself and kill turkeys in over 30 different states with six grand slams, two royal slams, yada, yada, yada. And, and, and it working on all turkeys and all subspecies. And that's what becomes successful. It's not being stuck into a corner or painted in a corner and only knowing one way of hunting them. That's what I love about turkey hunting. I love to archery whitetail deer hunt. And I don't want to offend any deer hunters that you have made listening to this thing because I love deer and I love to hunt deer. But quite honestly, deer hunting, you're very much a, you're, you're a victim or a slave to that deer's habits and the scouting that you've done to try and pinpoint when his movement occurs. After that, it's the rut. You might use deer sense. You might run him up. You might rattle him up. But that is not nearly as effective and nearly as three-dimensional as the million different tactics you can use to kill a spring gobbler. So that's why I love spring turkey hunting. It's so, so three-dimensional. Man, so good. I hope that uh, I hope that our listeners you know, which are all over the country and even outside the country, but I hope that they've been inspired to get out there. And especially the guys who haven't gotten into turkey hunting yet. I hope that this has given them, uh, an itch to go do it because I'm just speaking from my own experience. I hunted turkeys before I hunted elk, but once I started wow. hunting elk, I appreciated turkey hunting even more because there's so much of the similar dynamics. Um, you know, exactly. the calling, the challenging, you know, the give and take, the cat and the mouse, the pursuit, like, set up. I look, yeah, the setup. I look forward to turkey hunting so much more now that I've become an elk hunter and vice versa because the chase uh, and the interaction, there's so much similarities there. So it's super cool. It 100%. And, and this is coming from a guy that has yet to get to elk hunt. The only, the only, um, difference I see is the fact that you're going to get about 500 pounds more meat from an elk than <laughs> from a wild turkey. But you know what? If you love to hunt and you love to continue the heritage of hunting and passing it on, why in the world would you not get out, especially you guys out west, when some of the best weather of the year can be in the springtime? Cool mornings. It warms up during the daytime. You're out doing something that you'd love to do during the September and, you know, the September, October rut for, for elk. And, you know, it, it's something that you can carry on at different parts of the year and probably get nearly the same charge out of and carry on that tradition throughout the year. I mean, what, why else would you need, what more else do you need to go out 
a reason than you need to get out and get in the woods than to call turkeys in the fall in the spring like you do elk during the rut. I mean, again, you're not going to get quite as much meat off a wild turkey, but the challenge is there, the fun is there, the excitement is there, the interaction with the animal speaking to his own in his own language is there, and that for me is the, what seals the deal for turkey hunting for me. I love to waterfowl hunt, Mark, and I love I can run a pretty mean duck call, but it's not the same because they're not they're not openly responding to your calling. I mean, you can work them into a spread of deeks. I do it every year, but they're not gobbling at you and you're not engaging them in an actual conversation. And if you love to call wild animals and you love to elk hunt, you'd be a fool to not be out there during the springtime and some of the finest weather of the year to get out and chase turkeys. Yeah, for sure. And the same goes to the Eastern guys who want to or have or still – you know, in the process of learning to elk hunt, for example, because um, I know that you guys are listening as well, get out and turkey hunt in the spring, and that is going to relate to elk hunting experience as close as you can get to it anyway. You know, I get questions from guys of like, yeah, I grew up hunting deer, and now I want to go elk hunt. If you're sitting in a tree stand and hunting whitetail, there's not a whole lot that you're going to gather other than maybe some like, you know, shooting under pressure, things like that. But in terms of hunting and tactics, there's not a whole lot of transfer there. But these guys who can hunt turkey, you're making a different noise for sure. But those dynamics, that interaction, um, like you said, with setups, everything like that is going to directly apply to elk hunting. 100%, dude. And I haven't even elk hunted, but I, I, from every man that I've spoken to that elk hunts and that has had the ability to turkey hunt. And I, and I can honestly tell you this in, in with all honesty that I have turned a lot of guys that I met along the trail that elk hunt out West are now avid turkey hunters because it just extends that elk season in, in so many different ways. Scott, this has been so good, but I, we can't let you go without, you know, you letting us know where we can learn more. I know you mentioned the app, which for the listeners, um, is through got game tech, which for the listeners who have followed this podcast, it's the same kind of platform that Paul Medell, the elk nut has his app through. So if you've checked that out, you kind of know what you're getting into with Scott's app, but Scott, in addition to the app, which they can find in iTunes and Android store and all that, do you have a website? You kind of mentioned YouTube. Like, point us to those resources, places where we can follow you or go learn more about what you have to share. Awesome, buddy. Let me try to let me try to let's see. Uh, Scott underscore C underscore Ellis on Instagram. Um, my YouTube channel, Scott Ellis, which hosts my show Hunt Quest as well as Carbon TV, and my show is interactive. I mean, I'm constantly doing voiceovers in my show, talking about what we're doing why we're setting up this way, why I'm calling this way, how we were successful, how we failed. Um, my YouTube channel has numerous tips on calling, on setup, on the wild turkey, learning the language of the wild turkey, um, tons and tons of videos on, on learning about the wild turkey. My website, scottellishunting.com, is a great tool. for. Uh, it has links to some of the same web, t- web uh, or YouTube clips. It has uh, numerous world champion, grand national turkey calling champions that write articles and tips, as well as myself on how to hunt the wild turkey and how to hunt deer and everything else for that matter. Um, the app, as you mentioned, Paul Medell, the, the Elk Nut, um, we're on the same platform. We're the same people, which has got game technologies. And um, they are a great gro- group of guys that are actually diehard elk hunters. And now through me are learning how to turkey hunt. <laughs> so I'm really tickled about that. They're dying to get me out there to hunt some Miriam and Rios out west with the Pacific Northwest with those guys. And and last but not least is my DVD that's available on my website, scottellishunting.com, and available at with Midwest Turkey Supply. It's called Mouth Call Magic 1 and Mouth Call Magic 2. And those are both DVDs that go very deep into detail on how to create all of these sounds that I've mentioned and some that I've demonstrated. These These DVDs will help you learn to emulate the sounds and produce those same sounds on a mouth call. So um, I think that covered it all, brother. I think that's all my outlets for all the different ways that I'm trying to help the guy, the hunter, become a better turkey hunter. So, Yeah, that's what this show is all about, man. So not only thank you for giving us those resources, but all the information you shared in this episode. We really appreciate it. Awesome, brother. It was great to be here. It's always great 
to spread the knowledge and spread the word of turkey hunting. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. And it's really exciting to see the growth because, you know, hunters are the reason why we're able to hunt. The conservation, the, buy, the purchases of licenses, the donations, the heritage that passes it on from generation to generation. That's where we continue to enjoy the great space, sport of hunting and, and this, the Second Amendment, you know, right to bear arms. That all can, is all contingent on the hunters and people like you and me, my friend. So if we can spread that word and get more people involved in what we do, it's going to be better in the long run for everything we do for the animals, for conservation, for the sport of hunting. So thank you for having me and thanks for letting me ramble on for a little while, brother. Once again, thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. You can always contact us to podcast at xomountaingear.com with an email. We would love to see your questions, comments, or feedback. Be sure to check out all the resources that our guest Scott has to offer, including that Turkey Tech app in your app store from your mobile device, and so much more. Again, if you're enjoying the show, we'd love to see a review in iTunes or Stitcher or wherever else you might be listening to that. And stay tuned for future episodes. We have so much good content lined up. Hit the subscribe button and be sure to tune back in.